Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Amanda Huff. I'm the, from the Oxford office, which covers Surrey and Sussex sites. So I know some of you, and it's great to see you all here. Right. What I, I'm going to be talking for about 10 minutes or so, so I'm not going to be talking for long. But um, what I'm going to talk about is next year's work plan, what we're planning to do. A lot of it's going to be cons consolidating what we've been doing this year. What we're going to be looking at is the health, which Russell's already spoken about, refurbishment, um, improving leadership performance. Um, then we're also doing some local projects. We're doing one on scaffolding and one on, on basements. <coughs> I'm quite passionate about um, the health initiative. I think it has been a poor relationship. I agree with Russell. It's something we definitely need to get to grips with and we need to change the culture of the industry. We need to get people to realise that if they don't look after their health, they're not going to retire, they're not going to get to 60. I think it's a horrific, um, a lot of people do not reach retirement age in the construction industry. We need to change that. And we can, we really can change it. Um, we'll be looking at manual handling. I mean, how many construction workers have got a bad back? I think, I hate to think, but I imagine a lot of you, of you unfortunately, have got bad backs. And is that from when you first started in the industry? Noise, vibration, and dust. Vibration, I don't know, I think a lot of people have difficulty getting to grips with vibration. There, I don't know if any of you have gone to our website, there is a calculator where you put in the, the level and it tells you how long you can use it for. It's quite simple. Um, one of the problems I've been finding on site is when people hire in equipment, the hirer is not providing them with the information about the vibration levels the hirer must, they've got a legal duty. So if they're not providing the details, go back to them, ask them for it. If they haven't got it, they need to find out. They should be providing you, your guys with the vibration levels so you can work out what, what the, how long they should be using for it. Even better, they should be giving you an indication of how long you can use the tool for. Dust. I know we've, um, Russell's covered this, but it's another one of my... Um, passions, especially silica dust, it's a real concern. We reckon about 10 construction workers a week are dying from silica dust. So in a month that's 40 to 50 workers in this country. There's a, they're dying from lung cancer and from silicosis, which are all horrific diseases. And there's a lot we can do about it. The first thing we need to do is get people to use the dust, dust um, suppression. What I'm finding is sometimes they've got, they don't use it, as Russell says, they can't be bothered to get it from the van, was if we explain, well, you might not make retirement, maybe they'll be bothered to get the bottle out of the van, maybe that will persuade them. Sometimes the pipe is broken, the employer says, oh yeah, I'll get you a new one, but in the meantime, just carry on. No, zero tolerance. You do not cut anything with a disc cutter, which has got silica in it, unless you're using dust suppression. What, uh, there's a, a water bottle on this slide. I don't know if you can see it just there. I'm not sure it's because the guys were getting so thirsty that they, <laughs> they were having to drink a lot. Or whether, I don't know if you've seen it, where you've got the guy cutting the, the block and another guy bending over with the watering can or the bottle. So you've got both guys being exposed to very high levels of uh, dust. That is not acceptable. We do not accept people pouring bits of water over the, the block. They must have a, a bottle or a hose pipe. They must be using it properly. The other thing they must be using is a mask. And where I get the most grief from in all of my career, the thing I have the most um, aggression say, is asking people to be clean shaven. They get so upset. They've got to be clean shaven. If they've got stubble, it can reduce the, um, the effectiveness of the mask by 90%. Now, asbestos workers are clean shaven. They've got used to it. I mean, asbestos workers will carry a shaver with them. Why can't bricklayers and, and roofers do the same? Why can't we get them to be clean shaven? It's a change of culture. But, so I get a lot of people getting very upset when I say they've got to remove their stubble. They say, oh, my girlfriend likes it. Yeah, but my girlfriend might not like to look after you when you're ill, when she's having to push you in a wheelchair. So, you know, carry you to the toilet every, every hour. She's not going to like that. We've got to get the message across, this stuff kills you, you've got to take it seriously. If you've got to lose your beard, you've got to lose your beard. Or you can, wear, you can have a, you know, a blues-on type mask. I've never seen anyone use one of those, 
But if they, if they want to keep their beard, fair enough. But they've got to wear a mask. I don't want to hear excuses. When you're looking at that sort of situation, yeah. your proper, decent welfare is, is essential as well. Oh, it? gosh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, the number of jobs you go to me, there's like two sinks for 40 or 50 votes on the site or whatever the case is. You know? Oh, no, no sink at all. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. Or hot, hot car running water. Yeah. And, you know, it's, not, it's not the fact that you can share the sink. At the end of the shift, you've got, it's a bit like sort of being at the theatre when the lady yeah. comes up. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is true. I mean, to be honest, on a site like that, I wouldn't be surprised there's no welfare. Yeah, the, but I mean, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, the, sort of the standards that we're expecting some people to work in is. Yeah, but it's like Edwardian, is it? Or Victorian? It really is. Um, Amanda, yeah. I'm starting to come to conclusion because we've been talking about silica for probably the best part of a decade now. Mm -hmm. I know it goes right back to Egyptian mm. times originally. I'm wondering why are we not? And I'm not, not, not sort of wanting to answer this question, but just to there to, to people wonder. But we have a set of regulations for lead. We have a set of regulations for asbestos. And surely it's about time we think about. Set regulations specifically aimed at silica. You know, the guys are going home with their overalls. Oh, covered in, yeah. Shaking them out. Mm. This type of thing, the same problems we've had with asbestos, is still uh, are starting to manifest with silica. And it's a similar risk, it's a similar, yeah, it affects the lungs. I mean, we, it is covered by, if people comply with COSH, they won't be going home with silica on their, um, their overalls. But yes, we, I don't, as far as I know, there is no. I have to be careful what I say, but there's no, the government doesn't like new sets of regulations at the moment. So, but we have got COSH, we have got control of substances, has a so, so if we enforce that, I think we can adequately control silica. So I think, um, but what we do need to do is raise the profile. What I'd like to see is maybe some posters, you like the one like saying, which white van are you going home in tonight, which has got the, the ambulance on. Maybe we need some posters about silica. I'm not, um, you know, with people maybe using the oxygen mask, that sort of thing, just try and get this message across. I'd encourage any of you, to do to, if, you're, if you've got, you're in the position to, to do toolbox talks to your guys to explain the risk. Because if we, if we can change their mindset, they will wear the mask, they will use the damp, but until they, they get it, they won't. And that's the, I think you say, the law's there, I think, but we just need to get people, we need to put people on our side. <coughs> this is a, um, a man dry sweeping and there's a vacuum there. So this is talking about changing people's attitude. He's got the equipment, but he's just going to use a broom anyway. So we need to try and change people's, the way people think um, about their own health. Because the person he's putting at risk is himself. And there's other weights, I don't know if they're here today, but I know they've got a slogan, ban the broom. And I think that's a great, great simple slogan. I mean, you, you can't ban it completely, but it gets people's way of thinking. That let's, let's, use, let's use a hoover if we can. Um, wood dust. Um, woodworking tools should have extraction on them. It's, it, it, the technology's out there. Um, it should work and it should be used. Um, there's a lot of advantages by using extraction. It will save time and money. You won't need a labourer to clear up after you. There's health benefits and you won't get fee for intervention from the health and safety executive. That's the only time I'm going to mention fee for intervention. <laughs> We're going to do a refurb uh, initiative again. So these are not my photos, but I'm guessing that there isn't any scaffolding at the bottom of the, the roof edge here. So. <laughs> and it, it, why is that man taking that risk? But oh, yeah, the oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you got a hard hat in the jacket. <laughs> We can find the body, that's the thing. <laughs> this, what we were talking about coordination, and <laughs> I mean, this one, they're scaffolding up, but the guy's obviously working the wrong side of it. But then, let's go back another step. Why is he working the wrong side of it? Well, he needs to get access to that, so they haven't planned the scaffolding. The scaffolding hasn't been put in place so that he can work safely. So. OK, you can, the immediate cause is he stepped over the scaffolding, but there's more to it than that. You need to backtrack and say, well, why is he doing that? Well, he needs access, and they haven't thought about where to put the scaffold. So, This is my welfare one. It's not too gruesome. but Actually, I mean, this one's got soap. <laughs> um, I've had an argument with the director only last month 
where he had a bucket of cold water. And that was all, no tap, no, just bucket of cold water. And he thought that was totally suitable and sufficient for his guys on site. And you're just thinking, what century are you from? Um, Is that the point or the simple both? Mushy both. <laughs> <laughs> um, there should be hot running water on every single building site from the beginning of the site. A lot of contractors are doing that, and that's brilliant, but there's a hell of a lot who are not. When you think of the beginning of a site, you often have demolition groundworks. You've got the really dirty trays, and they've got things like this on site. So. <coughs> This is the sort of thing we would like. Hot running water, soap, towels. I don't think it can be that difficult. I don't like the exposed cable there. No, I don't like the exposed cable, but we're getting there, aren't we? We're, yeah. <laughs> right. Improving leadership performance. This is something that Russell's um, uh, talked about. This is something that we did in Oxted um, last year. We invited poor performers to come into our office for a half a day event. We went through the leadership and workers' involvement tool, which can be found on our website. And we also looked at what, where they were failing, and we talked about those topics. And we tried to, once again, it was a free seminar, tried to get them on our side. We tried to say, well, look, these are the solutions. It doesn't cost you very much, but this is the way forward. This is the way. But you need to lead, you need to manage your construction team. You, so it was the directors of, the, of small sites, small companies, who weren't quite getting it right. Yeah. It mostly was about 50%, so, yeah. I mean, it's not too bad, but, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's frustrating because you know that some, you know, the ones you really, really want to turn up. Shame we haven't got powers of arrest, isn't it? Is this still an opportunity to do what the sort of speeding police do? Well, it is. Uh, in to save you getting a private <laughs> you get an invite. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we do note the ones who don't turn up, and we will, then we say, yeah, if you don't turn up, we will, visit, we will try and visit your site. I mean, we are made aware of the ones who do visit and the, one, the ones who turn up and the ones who don't. And this, we, I'm going to mention it again, sorry, fee for intervention. So if they don't turn up, and then we're not... Go after <laughs> Couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> but, um, I mean... So we've already recognised them as poor performers, so we're already targeting them because these are the guys that we need to, to concentrate on. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I mean, I say, the ones who do come in, it's great because some of them, they want to get it right, they just haven't, they're a small company, maybe they've got all these other pressures and they haven't really thought about health and safety seriously enough before. And, uh, and so we're doing this nationally now, so right across the country, um, companies will be invited to come in um, and to, to use this leaders, leadership tool and we do encourage you all to encourage your contractors to use this tool. Uh, major projects, but well, that's one of the things we'll be looking at next year. Um, these are some that are obviously in London, the Battersea Power Station. I thought Wimbledon had been done, but I'm not sure. I'm not, um, Northern Line Extension, Blumenberg Place, River Light Project, London Tower Tunnels and Thames Tideaway Tunnels. Apparently, there's like a new Disneyland going to be built in Kent, so that, um, another project that we might be looking at, hopefully. <laughs> oh! <laughs> um, we're looking at scaffolding, just before I... I'm still finding um, loading bays with single guardrails. That hasn't been law since 1995. I'm convinced that some of the scaffolders weren't born when they changed the law, so it's, it's not acceptable to have a single guardrail on a loading bay. If they put one on, think about maybe using a different scaffolder, because they're not up to date. They are very behind the times. Um, there's two projects going on again with scaffolders. One's a London project. Um, in London, they're planning to visit their head offices of scaffolders and then talk about how they're, they're managing risks. In the southeast, we're going to be mail shotting scaffolders and then we're going to carry out a blitz of certain towns and look and see how they're complying with the, the relevant standards. This follows um, a prosecution that we took recently following a member of the public who took a photo with their mobile phone, which um, I'll show you the photo or photos. This is the first one. Um, so, yeah, so 
standing on a, the top rail. What they should have been doing is they should have been working behind a guardrail, they should have been working on a fully boarded platform, and they should have been wearing harnesses. They weren't wearing any, doing any of that, and there's a very clear risk. If they, this was a, a three-storey office block. If they'd fallen, one, they could have killed themselves, and they could also called, killed a member of the public if they'd fallen on one of them. And then it, on, it was like a high street, so... Uh, Again, yeah, it's, people always have the jacket on, don't they? <laughs> and this, the same member of the public took this photo while they were doing up the back of the. Um, so we, there was no, there was amazingly, and there was no accident, which is great. But the HSE considered this to be so serious that we obviously took a, um, court action, and the, the company was taken to court um, recently and, and fined. So. But we, I mean, people are taking photos all the time now on their mobile phone and sending them in, which is great. So if people are doing something silly. We've now got the evidence to quickly catch up on them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, sometimes the fines are quite low, but hopefully, the whole process of taking someone to court is not a nice experience. So, hopefully, that will be a deterrent in itself. But uh, we're doing a well, London's doing a basement initiative. Um, this is going to take place in the southwest and northwest of London can take place in March and the key issues are collapse of excavations, building collapse, poor access, manual handling and risk to public from open excavations and so this will be taking place in London. <coughs> These are some photos that were took, taken sorry, last year and I've just put the comment scary. <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> Oh, red concerns, I haven't filled this in, but I don't know if any of you have had the delight of using our complaints procedure. It's, well, you now, have you ever got, if you've got a concern, you phoned up our, Lund, our Bootle office, Bootle then grade it. If they grade it red, it then comes down to the inspector to go out and visit, and it'd be things like people, obviously risk the members of the public, um, people working on roofs where there's no edge protection, things that need to be dealt with fairly quickly, and we try and get someone out as quickly as possible. It's not always possible, but and that's a red concern. And lastly, we're going to do a, in the, uh, the southeast, we're doing a roads proje roadworks project where we'll be looking at roadworks and in particular the hours operatives are working and their shift patterns. It's not an easy topic to deal with and I don't think it's one that we've dealt with in much detail before. Um, but this follows a fatal accident on the A24 where it was identified that shift patterns were not being managed and that fatigue was a potential risk. If you've got men working on roads, night after night, working long hours, they're getting tired, they're going to make mistakes, and sometimes this can, say, prove drastic. Oh, last one, this is my hobby horse, this is my, um, it's fragile roofs. Um, it's tragically still a major problem. Um, I'm currently investigating two accidents where the guys were in comas for several weeks. Um, they've amazingly survived, which is brilliant, but their lives are not going to be the same anymore. Um, a lot of people still don't get fragile roofs. I'm, it's a really high risk area, and if people don't understand it, don't do it. Please do not go on to, do not work on a fragile roof. I'm seeing p poor method statements where it says use harness, which is my red rag to a bull. Um, if you have to use a harness, and this is for any work, it's essential that there's a safe anchor point. But in these method statements, it never says where the anchor point is. You're like, what are you going to attach this harness to? It is, and sometimes they say, oh, we're going to fix it to the cherry picker. Well, on the cherry picker, most cherry pickers, it will tell you you can't fix a harness to the outside, because not only will the poor guy fall, but the shock loading can cause the cherry picker to fall. So not only is he going to hit the ground, he's then going to have a bloody great cherry picker coming hurtling towards him. So planning, using your nails, you say, making sure you do it right. If you have to work on a fragile roof, see if you can work inside the cherry picker. If it's sort of like some minor alteration works and you can do it from inside the cherry picker, great. If you can't, then you're looking at nets, you're looking at crawling boards, and you're looking at a perimeter scaffold around the edge. And this is even for short duration work because the risk is so high, it really is. It's like walking on an iced pond. It, it can crack at any moment. 
the tragic consequences. So just to very quickly summarise, we're going to be targeting health, we're going to still be doing small sites, we're going to be doing refurbishment, we're going to be doing fragile roofs, and anything else which crops up, <laughs> which comes as a red concern. And I wish you all a very healthy and safe <coughs> Christmas. So thank you. Thank you very